Hi, today we're going to talk about zero trust networking with a service mesh. And we're really going to focus in some of the, on some of the principles that get you to zero trust networking. Uh, specifically, we'll talk about service identities, authorization, authentication, encryption, time-bound access, and audits and logs. So let's start with service identity, and we'll start with an example. So if you have a service mesh running, and you have some services, let's start with A and B, and then here we have your service mesh. So for each one of your services, behind the scenes, your service mesh is creating this service identity for each of these services. And this service identity is a logical construct that represents each one of your services. And your identity has a TLS certificate that's tied to it to prove the authenticity of that identity and of that, uh, that service itself. All right, so service identities, we'll talk a little bit more on how it plays a role in really uh, encrypting and authenticating and authorizing your services, but we'll put that on hold for now. Let's talk about how data moves uh, between your services within a service mesh. So between service A and B, traffic doesn't go directly over the network between A and B. It actually goes through what we call a proxy. And there are different proxies that can be used for console, console uses Envoy. In any case, your traffic between A and B actually goes through this proxy, so all traffic in and out of a service will always go through this proxy of that respective service. So now that traffic is going through these proxies, it becomes an important piece in managing and shaping and routing traffic between different services. So there's a lot of control in these proxies. So that leads us into the next point, which is authorization how to authorize or allow and deny services from one point to another point. Traditionally, you would maybe use something like a firewall that is allowing or denying traffic from service A that has a certain IP address to service B that has a certain IP address, right? So we'll call this IP A, IP B, and it's gated through a firewall that's determining access using an IP address as a unit of control. So that can become challenging because services scale up and scale down, IPs change, so having to maintain and update these firewalls can be painful. So instead of using this trad traditional method, service identities can be used. So now this, that's where we're gonna talk a little bit more about service identities and how it can help. So rather than using IP addresses, service identities can be the unit of control to determine access, right? So what a developer or an admin or, or whoever, they can go into uh, the service mesh and they can say, hey, I wanna create a rule that allows service A to talk to service B. So basically, what that'll do is, it'll actually go to the, the, the uh, proxy here. Since I, I talked about how this proxy has a lot of control uh, over you know, how traffic moves, that's, that proxy is really enforcing these rules. So it's gonna allow or deny traffic to move between these two proxies, right? So now you have a way of authorizing your services to communicate or not using the service mesh and uh, enforced by this, this proxy here, all right? So now let's talk about authentication and encryption. So within your service mesh, once services are authorized and they want to communicate, uh, what happens is the service mesh behind the scenes has already distributed these TLS certificates that we talked about earlier, right, to the proxies. And what the proxies, what they do, is they exchange these TLS certificates between the proxies to verify and authenticate the authenticity of these services. Once it's verified, traffic can then flow, but traffic is also encrypted, so now, you are secure, and this process is called MTLS. All right, so now you're secure from an authorization point of view, authentication point of view, and encryption point of view using these service identities. The next part is time-bound access. So going back to these service identities that are tied to these TLS certificates, these TLS certificates have a certain time to live, a T TTL is what it's referred to. 
Um, and what this says is that they will expire within a certain amount of time. And that's what you want. You don't want this, these uh, TLS certificates to be around forever. You want them to expire and have to be renewed and have to be rotated. And that service mesh manages all that for you. Uh, once it's expired, the service mesh will generate new ones and redistribute them out. So you know, now you're rotating them on a frequent, more frequent basis, which is always a, a better security practice, okay? Then lastly, um, everything within the service mesh should always be uh, logged and audited, right? So you don't want to have any type of unauthorized access. And uh, if you do, you can always go back and look at the logs and see what has occurred in terms of access into your service mesh, right? All right, so those are sort of the, the six principles that really get you to achieve zero trust networking using a service mesh. What I want to touch on next is to extend it a little further and talk about some of the integrations that we have here at HashiCorp for console service mesh with HashiCorp's Vault. So let's go and talk about that here. And more specifically, we'll talk about how we can use Vault's PKI engine and Vault's secrets management To achieve this. All right, so starting first with Vault's PKI engine. So we talked about this, you know, these TLS certificates that can be generated by your service mesh. Uh, a lot of times that, you know, it's all built in. However, as a best practice, you want these TLS certificates to be generated by an external CA, right? An external uh, product that will manage and store these uh, TLS certificates. So it just so happens that Vault has a PKI, PKI engine that is made specifically for that. And we've made a nice integration between Vault and Console to be able to do that, right? So now, instead of these TLS certificates being generated within the service mesh, the service mesh can retrieve these TLS certificates that were generated by Vault, pull them, in, pull them into the service mesh and redistribute them to the, uh, to the, the proxies for the, the MTLS uh, process, right? So now, you have everything stored here, everything's encrypted within Vault. Vault has a lot of built-in capabilities that enhances uh, the, the, the storage and, and secrets management of your TLS certificate. All right, so now this is, you know, we just talked about TLS certificates on the data plane. Now, let's talk about the control plane. Within your service mesh, now we're gonna, you know, focus in on console's service mesh. Uh, within your console service mesh, it's made up of a bunch of different components. And we'll, use the console servers as an example. These servers, console servers, are usually communicating with each other. And depending on uh, what they're communicating, how they're communicating, there are various different types of secrets that are used to ensure that traffic between these, these, uh, these servers are secure as well. So uh, we have TLS certificates, just like we did earlier, but these TLS certificates will, will verify the authenticity of each of the uh, server nodes. We also have ACL tokens. There are also various types of keys that are stored as well uh, to, again, ensure that that communication is uh, secure. So these are all considered secrets. And so today, if you're deploying console onto Kubernetes, you, you can, you can do that, and what will happen is it'll be stored on Kubernetes secrets, which is fine, right? It works today, but it's not perfect, there are some things that can be improved upon. So for example, Kubernetes secrets are not encrypted by default. They're only basics for encoded. There's also limited, um, limited control of the access to these secrets, right? You can't control, you know, who can have access to which secrets for how long, right? Um, and then lastly, there's this concept of secret sprawl. So if you have your service mesh deployed on multiple different Kubernetes clusters, you have naturally these different you know, sets of secrets spread across different clusters. So there's no central management of these secrets. There's just you know, one big sprawl. So what you can do instead is have Vault be integrated with console so that all your secrets can be stored on Vault versus being stored on Kubernetes secrets. So now, if you're doing that, it's much better from a security point of view 
because all your secrets are encrypted by default, right? There's more advanced capabilities to control the type of access into specific, uh, sp specific secrets. It's very granular, uh, and also for how long and have those, those secrets or those, those access get expired, right? Remember, we talked about time bound. They can expire as well. And then lastly, everything's centrally stored in Vault, which a lot of organizations are already doing this. They're using Vault as a central secrets management, which is you know, what it's built for, uh, among other things. And so now you have a central location, all your secrets are stored there. You can have centralized visibility, centralized reporting, centralized auditing, just general cent centralized management of all your secrets across the board. So just a better approach to storing secrets. So just want to say that hopefully this made sense uh, and you're able to see how organizations can use service meshes to achieve zero trust networking. And hopefully you can also see how console and vault can be uh, working together in conjunction to improve your uh, security posture even more. If you have any more questions about zero trust networking, take a look at the links provided in our description. And thanks for watching.